the first thing I'd like to clear up is that I don't use marijuana, and I never have, not even when I studied at Berkeley in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I must have been my college square. I'm here because of my wife, Patricia. Back in 1991, when she was a graduate student at Caltech, she developed a painful chronic bladder inflammation that got so bad she had to drop out of school. A urologist spent several years testing different medications on her, none of which helped. Finally, he resorted to a more invasive treatment involving electricity that sounds like something straight out of Abu Ghraib. That worked for about six weeks. When it wore off, he told her there was nothing more he could do and said goodbye. Luckily, by that time, Californians were getting ready to vote on Proposition 215. It turned out that marijuana worked. After a few months of using it, her bladder function returned to normal, and so did our lives, except for one thing. We were now facing the wrath of the most powerful government in the world. A government that insisted, as it still insists today, that marijuana is medically useless. This useless drug helped Patricia so much that she was able to go back to school and finish her PhD. Astounded by what had happened, she started looking into the science behind medical marijuana. It turned out that not only was the real science behind the claims of medical marijuana users, the science actually sounded important and interesting. <coughs> she learned some astounding things about cannabinoids the class of molecules to which the active ingredients of marijuana belong. Not only can they relieve pain and nausea, they can reduce inflammation in the brain and central nervous system. They can improve the quality and quantity of sleep. The list goes on. I'm sure everyone here knows what's on it. The most surprising thing she learned was that cannabinoids can kill or shrink many kinds of cancer cells. It turns out that the federal government knew back in the 1970s that the cannabinoids in marijuana are able to kill or shrink breast and lung cancer cells. But they refused to authorize any follow-up research until conducting a similar, though secret, preclinical trial in the mid-1990s. They knew that THC would kill cancer cells, yet they failed to follow up on that for two decades, and then tried to keep it a secret from the American public. Why would they do that, given the number of Americans who are dying every year from breast and lung cancer? I don't have them here to ask the question, but I bet they kept Americans in the dark about science because they feared it would, quote, send the wrong message to children about drugs, unquote. That's the problem with drug policy and science. The people paid by the government to fight drug abuse like to use science as a propaganda tool in that struggle. There's nothing wrong with that in principle. It's good for people to understand the potential harms of anything they put into their bodies. The problem is, when it comes to marijuana policy, the folks in the drug war bureaucracy step over the line from using science to abusing science and even censoring science. The Drug Enforcement Administration and the National Institute on Drug Abuse act as a tag team in that respect. The DEA refuses to reschedule marijuana, claiming there isn't enough scientific evidence. At the same time, NIDA uses its monopoly power over the distribution of marijuana for research to block research that would provide evidence. The most blatant example of this behavior came last year when NIDA blocked an FDA-approved clinical trial testing marijuana as a remedy for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. It's especially sad to note that the study participants were veterans with PTSD deemed untreatable by other means. After 12 years of war, this is how we treat them. I have to wonder what message we're sending to children by doing that. As a physicist, I can assure you that this is not how physics works. For example, I work on superstring theory. The super and superstrings comes from something called supersymmetry. 
I won't go into what that means here. I'll just say that there are physicists like myself who find this idea extremely appealing. And there are other physicists who dislike the idea of supersymmetry intensely. But as much as the latter group dislikes the idea, they would never dream of blocking research because they suspected the outcome might, quote, send the wrong message about supersymmetry. <laughs> Such behavior would not be tolerated by the field. We're all expected to act like grown-ups and accept it gracefully as experiments prove our favorite theories are false. In physics, unlike marijuana policy, we consider the right message to send to be the message that's true. And that's the case everywhere else in science, at least in basic research. That being said, one might wonder why there aren't more high-profile scientists rising up to demand stop to be science-abusing shenanigans by the DEA and NIDA. I can give you three reasons. First, if scientists were good at politics, we'd be politicians, not scientists. <laughs> Second, normally when scientists interact with the federal government, we're asking them for the money we need to do science. And third, we're used to the government not paying attention to scientists' advice on policy matters. <laughs> there are mechanisms, such as reports by the National Research Council and advice from the Presidential Science Advisor, to communicate the best available science. Unfortunately, politics often trumps the science. Luckily, that's not the whole story when it comes to science and public policy. To see why it isn't the whole story, we need to go back to the beginning of modern science during the period historians call the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment. This also happened to be the age when Europeans were avidly engaged in persecution of witches. The period of witch hunting lasted from about 1480 until around 1735. Nicholas Copernicus who first argued that the Earth and the planets revolve around the sun, contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church, was born in 1473. Isaac Newton, who set the heliocentric model of the solar system on a firm mathematical footing and discovered the physical laws of gravitation and optics, died in 1727. So the period of witch hunting in Europe lasted from about the birth of Copernicus until around the death of Newton. During that period, many thousands of innocent people were tried, tortured, and executed for crimes that we recognize today as having existed only in the fearful brains of their accusers. <laughs> there are many theories on why the witch hunts happened. But it's important to note that it was not the protests of famous scientists that stopped them. In fact, most scientists of that era believed in the supernatural, just as many scientists today except what the federal government claims is true about marijuana. At least they believe that fighting back is futile. So what happened during that period of the rise of science in Western culture that led to change? Thanks to the invention of the printing press, the educated public could read about science. This was not just the dawn of science. This was the dawn of popular science writing and the beginning of public science literacy. People found the new science of men like Galileo and Newton exciting. For example, after Galileo invented the telescope, people could see the surface of the moon for the first time. They could see that it was not a heavenly sphere, but more like a giant flying rock. This new philosophy of science, which depended on measurements and observations rather than pure faith for its claims to truth, became an important subject of conversation wherever educated people gather. Because of this, Isaac Newton's work on optics turned him into the world's first celebrity scientist. By the time of Newton, even dedicated witch hunters found themselves succumbing to the pressure to make peace with a new philosophy based on reason, measurement, and science. In 1666, a clergyman named Joseph Glanville a fervent advocate of both witch hunting and the new philosophy of science, proposed using methods of experimental science to map out the locations of the remaining witches 
alleged to be hiding in rural England. Glanville's dream of forging some third-way compromise between witch hunting and science never came true. Newton died in 1727 and was buried in a place of high honor in Westminster Abbey. Just eight years later, the Parliament of Great Britain passed the Witchcraft Act of 1735, making it a crime to accuse someone of being a witch. <clears throat> High-profile scientists like Isaac Newton did not stop the witch hunts. They didn't even try. But the public fascination with the works of Newton and others created the conditions for the transition to an evidence-based society. A society where people could no longer be tortured and executed for crimes that existed only in the fearful minds of their accusers. Invisible demons were no longer allowed to testify in court. Today you can turn on the TV at almost any time of day and find a show that stars a team of forensic scientists searching for material evidence needed to solve some heinous crime. That's a measure of what kind of evidence-based society we've become. We have entire TV series based on the scientific examination of material evidence. Science has become deeply embedded in our concept of criminal justice. The big exception is marijuana policy. That is where the DEA and NIDA function as the Joseph Landmills of the 21st century. They've been trying to forge a third way where they allow scientists to study synthetic cannabinoids while treating the plant itself like some demon with the power to bring about hell on earth. Two months after taking office in his first term, President Obama endorsed the principle of basing government policy on sound science. Compared to his predecessor, this was a much needed breath of fresh air. In a speech celebrating the restoration of federal funding for embryonic stem cell research, our new president said the previous policy was misguided. Rather than furthering discovery, our government has forced out what I believe is a false choice between sound science and moral values, he explained. To better guide federal policy, President Obama issued a memorandum to all executive departments and agencies that began, quote, science and the scientific process must inform and guide decisions of my administration on a wide range of issues, including improvement of public health, protection of the environment, increased efficiency in the use of energy and other resources, mitigation of the threat of climate change, and protection of national security. This directive seemed to confirm America's commitment to innovation by protecting what President Obama called, quote, free and open scientific inquiry, unquote. He said researchers should be able to work free from manipulation or coercion, while policymakers, quote, listen to what they tell us even when it's inconvenient, unquote. Advocates for stem cell research applauded loudly when the president said his intention was, quote, ensuring that scientific data are never distorted or concealed to serve a political agenda, and that we make scientific decisions based on facts, not ideology, unquote. The Obama administration has improved the role of science in the decision-making process in many areas of government. Again, the big exception is marijuana policy, where the president drops comments about frying fish and leaves the concealment and distortion of scientific evidence in marijuana policy unquestioned and unexplored. History, unfortunately, shows science has rarely been a factor in deciding federal marijuana policy. Representing the American Medical Association, Dr. William Woodward testified against the first federal marijuana law in 1937. He explained that marijuana was being used as a medicinal substance, and doctors had found no evidence that it was harmful. The new law, he warned, would discourage research into medical applications of the drug. Congress did not take Dr. Woodward's objection seriously, just as the testimony of doctors and scientists on federal marijuana policy is ignored today. The Drug Enforcement Agency takes the position that uh, marijuana belongs to the Schedule I category of controlled substances as a deadly narcotic on a par with heroin, too dangerous to be prescribed by doctors for medical use. 
It was a politically motivated classification when the Nixon administration established it in the 1970s, and that remains the case today. With the Obama administration's evidence-free denial of a peti petition for rescheduling last year. Like Joseph Glanville, when it comes to marijuana, the Obama administration wants to have their signs and their demonic forces too. In an evidence-based society, the only way they can get away with this is to use their power to distort and restrict scientific research. But their time is running out. This is the age of the internet, when people don't have to wait for popular science books to be written. They can link directly to peer-reviewed research the moment it's published. This unprecedented level of public access to scientific research is changing the game for medical of marijuana reform. Public skepticism towards the DEA's position on medical marijuana is at an all-time high. 18 states and the District of Columbia have legalized the medical use of marijuana, and this has been accomplished through both the popular vote and the agreement of state legislators. Public debate over the subject has mostly been confined to the question of how exactly marijuana should be delivered to the patients in states allowing its use. Increasing numbers of medical professionals are speaking out in support of the new laws as the biochemical understanding of marijuana's medicinal properties continues to grow. Last year, Dr. Susan Sisley at the University of Arizona at Phoenix attempted to conduct clinical trials of marijuana treatments for American veterans suffering from extreme post-traumatic stress disorder. I referred to this project at the beginning of my talk. She won FDA approval for a placebo-controlled pilot study for 50 <coughs> veterans. Winning FDA approval would be sufficient for research on any other drug. With marijuana, however, scientists must also apply to the National Institute on Drug Abuse in order to purchase the only legal supply of marijuana. NIDA turned down Dr. Sisley's request. As their director explained, NIDA's mission is to support research into the harms, not the benefits, of marijuana. Essentially, NIDA's mission is to block any research that could undermine the Schedule I status of marijuana as a dangerous narcotic, as the DEA insists. One has to wonder, would NIDA administrators have rejected the study if they had anticipated that it would prove marijuana does not work as a remedy for PTSD? <coughs> This tactic of NIDAS had some success in the short term. Officials in Arizona declined to add PTSD to the list of qualifying conditions for medical marijuana use in their state. However, this blatant act by NIDA appears set to backfire on them in Oregon, where there was another move to have PTSD recognized as a qualifying condition for medical marijuana. An art article in the Oregon Register Guard duly noted the critics of medical marijuana point to the lack of controlled studies done in America. This statement was immediately countered by doctors and psychiatrists complaining that the federal government has stopped such studies from going forward over the past decade. The Obama administration can't get away with claiming there's not enough research now that the public is wise to the fact that the administration itself is keeping the research from being done. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to spot a rigged game. As a former fan of Lance Armstrong, I'd like to add to it. I'd like to add here that cheaters make me mad. And cheaters who use their power to intimidate other people into cheating with them make me even madder. Now, the outcome of the Tour de France doesn't matter that much to the world in the grand scheme of things. But it's vital for the interest of human society to keep science honest, to keep it from being corrupted and used as a tool for anything other than the search for the truth about the physically measurable world. There's some hope peeking out now on the horizon in Congress. Representatives Earl Blumenauer and Sam Farr recently introduced legislation that would end the federal conflict with state medical cannabis programs. Farr's bill, the Truth in Trials Act, would allow patients, caregivers, and providers 
or in compliance with state law, to offer evidence of the medical necessity for their use of cannabis. Luminar's bill, entitled the State's Medical Marijuana Patient Protections Act, would move the cannabis out of Schedule I of the Controlled Substances Act and allow for medical research to be controlled by any agency other than the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Both bills seek to move marijuana from beyond the realm of the demonic influence and into the normal evidence-based world of the 21st century. However, I view Blumenauer's bill as the more important of the two because it would allow for open and objective research on marijuana governed by scientists rather than by the DEA and NIDA. Those two agencies get their funding largely based on the public fear of marijuana. They have a vested interest in abusing science to maintain that level of fear. Consider what American science might look like if all research were run like marijuana research is being run now. Suppose the Institute for Creation Science were put in charge of approving paleontology digs into signs of human evolution. <laughs> Imagine what would happen to the environment if we gave coal and oil companies the power to block any climate research they didn't like. <laughs> the fact is that science and literacy is a tool for social power. People are seeing this fact in action right here, right now, at this conference, and in the changes that have been affected in marijuana policy already in the 16 or so years since the passage of Proposition. Society is advancing very rapidly in terms of science and technology. Anyone who wants to say in the future had better learn to speak the language of science. I hope you'll come away from this meeting with more than just a commitment to reforming marijuana science. I hope you'll come away with a desire to keep learning science to make sure your children are science literate and help further the cause of science, technology, engineering, and math education at all levels in the educational system. Finally, let us try to persuade President Obama to include medical marijuana research in his call for free and open scientific inquiry, free from manipulation or coercion.